Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to be thinking about how we define topography on the surface of the Earth and we're also going to start thinking about how geologists deal with the subsurface. So the subsurface means essentially any rocks which are underground, so we can't get to them, we can't touch them, we can't look at them, we can't measure them. So what we have to do is we have to use measurements that we take on the surface of the Earth to predict what happens to layers of rock in the subsurface. So this presentation is going to correspond to section 2.4 in your textbook. So to begin with, we're going to think about some of the terms when we use when we're referring to differences in topography. So if we look at the diagram on the bottom of the slide, we can see there's a couple of rather simple ways in which we can talk about the topography that we're looking at. We can talk about it with reference to its height, and we can talk about it with reference to its slope. So now we're going to think about some of the terms that we use when we're talking about this kind of stuff and what they actually mean. So the first term, and probably the one you're going to be most familiar with, is elevation. And elevation is defined as the height of a location above sea level. Now, depending on where you are in the world, the units in which it's measured is going to be different. So if you're somewhere like the United Kingdom, you would measure it as meters above sea level. If you're in the United States, you would use feet above sea level. So always bear that in mind when you're looking at maps. Check the unit so you know what you're dealing with. Now, the first question you're probably thinking is, well, why do we use sea level as our starting height, as our datum it's referred to. Well, we use sea level as our datum because the coast is just so widespread. There are loads of places on the surface of the Earth where you are at the coast. And of course, if you're at the coast, you can work out where sea level is and you can use that to start measuring height. So the fact that uh, the sea is so ubiquitous means that there are loads of locations from which you can start using sea level to begin your measuring. Now, in terms of sea level, we don't just pick any time of the day to take our measurements. What we have to do is we have to use what's referred to as mean sea level. The problem is, is that sea level, of course, rises and falls every day depending on the tides. And so what we do is we take an average of sea level and we use that as our starting height. And of course, because it's our datum, it's our starting height, we give it the value zero. And so sea level is referred to as zero, and of course the elevation is therefore going to be the difference in height between the sea level where we're starting and our location. So it's a relatively simple concept. Now the next concept we're going to think about is relief. And relief is most commonly used in areas of topography, typically when they're a bit further away from the coast. So what you'll do is you'll have a point where you know the difference in height and you know it with some accuracy. And that's going to be the point where you start measuring from. Now, relief at its crudest level is simply referred to as either high or low. So a high relief area would be something like mountainous terrain. A low relief area would be a floodplain where the ground is relatively flat. Now, relief is actually defined as the difference in height between two locations. So, of course, the bigger the difference, the greater the relief. And so that means that in locations where you have lots of topography, so you have lots of changes in height relatively quickly, of course, that's going to mean you'll tend to have high relief. Now, the final thing that we can use to describe our terrain is going to be the steepness of the slope. So the steepness is simply referred to as a change in height over a set distance. And so all it means is if I was to walk one kilometer horizontally, what would be the change in height vertically? And so it's not uncommon for steepness of slope to be given as a ratio. So it would be one, two, whatever the change of height is. So, you know, if you were for every one kilometer you walked horizontally, you went up one kilometer in height, the ratio would be one to one. Now, in general terms, we'll typically simply refer to slope as either steep or gentle. And so there are ways in which you can refer to your observations in a more broad fashion. You know, is it high relief? Is it low relief? Is it steep? Is it gentle? But then there are also methods where we can actually get numerical values, such as elevation, relief with regard to two different locations, and the ratios that we use when we're actually defining steepness of slope using values, numbers.
So the next topic we need to think about is how geologists depict features in the subsurface. So the first thing we need to remember is that geologists can only collect data from rocks to which they have access. And most of these rocks are going to be found in outcrops on the surface of the earth. And so this means that when a geologist goes to an outcrop, there's a few pieces of data which we'll want to collect. The first piece of data we'll try and collect is the thickness of the layer. And then we'll also think about the angle of the layer. So one of the things we need to think about as geologists is how is the layer of rock going into the earth? Is it horizontal? Is it vertical? Is it going in at 45 degrees? These are the types of measurements we need to take. Now, these measurements of a, layers of, rock, of a layer of rock's angle is referred to as its dip. So the dip of a layer of rock can be anywhere between 0 and 90 degrees. 0 would be horizontal, 90 would be vertical. So if we look at this diagram here, you can see we have four layers of rock and the top three we can quite clearly see are horizontal. So they would have a dip of zero. Now, we would know this because as geologists, we could go to the outcrop. We could put a special tool on the outcrop, which is called a compass clinometer. And we can use this to measure the dip of the layer of rock. At the same time, we can also take a measurement of the thickness of the layer. The final piece of data that we're going to collect is something which is referred to as the dip direction. And that means if our layer of rock does have, an does have an angle to it, which way is that angle going? Is it dipping? So is it angled towards the north? Is it angled towards the east, the south, the west, or somewhere in between? So for every layer of rock that we can find, geologists will try and get its thickness, its dip, and its dip direction. And we'll use this to produce diagrams of the subsurface. So we'll use those measurements and we'll use them to predict what's happening to layers of rock in the subsurface where we can't see them. So there are three styles of diagram through which we will represent what we believe is happening in the subsurface. So the first diagram style is a block diagram. And this is a three dimensional diagram and it's very, very helpful. So if we look at our block diagram here, you can see we're not only getting an idea of what's happening to the layers of rock in this orientation, we also have an idea of what's happening to the layers of rock in this orientation. So it means we can look, think about our layer of rock in three dimensions, which is always helpful. So as I've said, the way in which we are going to draw the layers of rock in our subsurface is going to be defined by the measurements that we can take at our outcrops. And so in this instance, we will have used our compass clinometer and we will have taken a dip angle for the layer of layers of rock. In this case, this layer, this layer and this layer are going to have a dip of zero. So they're horizontal. And so in our diagram, we would draw them horizontally. Now, in terms of how thick the layer is, once again, we will have taken that measurement at the outcrop and we will also transfer that onto our block diagram. Now, the great thing is, is that we'll not only take the measurements for this orientation, we will also take the measurements for this orientation as well. And so this means in our block diagram, we can not only draw this face, but we can draw this face as well. And these three dimensional diagrams are amazingly helpful because they give you a better idea of what's going on, because we are by our nature three dimensional creatures. We, we like to think about things in three dimensions. Now, the next method for producing a diagram for the subsurface is a cross section. And this is arguably the most common method used by geologists. And so a cross section is simply a diagram that shows what would happen if we were to take a slice through the earth between two locations. So uh, what a geologist will do is we will pick a starting point and an end point for our cross section. So if we look at this diagram here, we would pick a point here, which would be referred to as A, and would pick a point here, which we would refer to as A prime. And the line between those two points is going to be referred to as our line of section. And so what the cross section represents is essentially if we were to take a giant knife and cut open the surface of the earth between points A and A prime, what would we see? That's the aim of the cross section to show us a 2D representation of what the rocks are doing along that line of section only. Now, you'll notice that like 
the block diagram, we have to include the topography on our cross section. So we're actually putting on the physical features of the surface of the earth into our cross section. You'll notice again the layers of rock are drawn horizontally. That's going to be based on the measurements that we took using our compass clinometer. And the thickness of the rock is also going to be based on the measurements that we took at the outcrop. Now, over here, we have the third style of diagram that we can use to define what's going on in the subsurface. This is a stratigraphic section. Now, the thing you'll notice about a stratigraphic section is that there is no topography on it. We don't really care about topography in a stratigraphic section. The stratigraphic section is primarily there simply to show us the thickness of layers and the order of the layers. So once we've worked out the uh, the relative ages of the layers, we can put them into an ordered sequence, can't we? Now, the principle of superposition says for this sequence, the oldest layer will be at the bottom and the youngest layer will be at the top. And so that's exactly how our cross uh, stratigraphic section is set up. Oldest layer at the bottom, youngest layer at the top. And you'll notice that the thicknesses of the layers as drawn on the stratigraphic section are consistent with the thicknesses that we would measure on the outcrop. Now, this isn't always the case, but a good stratigraphic section will be drawn with the correct thicknesses for each layer. Now, sometimes if you're dealing with sedimentary rocks, the width of the layer can also be used to help us get extra information. So typically, in this particular instance, what you'll notice is that each of these different layers, so we have a sandstone here, a limestone here, and a conglomerate here, they're all about the same width. Okay. Now, if we're talking about these different layers of rocks, they're actually going to be made of different class sizes. And so if you have a clastic sedimentary rock, what you can do is you can actually vary the width of the stratigraphic section to show that the class size is changing. Typically, the broader, so the wider the layer of rock on the diagram, the larger the class sizes. So the conglomerate here, which has these bigger class in it, should, if you're, if you're you know, taking into account the class size, the layer would come out a lot further. Okay. In contrast, the sandstone, which has smaller class in it, wouldn't be anywhere near as wide. So stratigraphic sections are quite helpful because they tell us the order in which the layers of rock occur and they show us the thicknesses. And if we are also including that information, we can also use them as a way of showing the changes in class sizes between different layers. But in the case of the stratigraphic section, it doesn't actually take into account anything to do with topography. And it also doesn't take into account the dip of the layers of rock because we're just dealing with a small section of the total diagram. So the layers of rock could be dipping at 45 degrees, but the stratigraphic section wouldn't really care. It's just simply a tool through which we put the layers of rock in the correct order. So it doesn't take into account topography and it doesn't take into account dip. So what we're going to do now is we're going to think about the sequence of events which we can see in these block diagrams. So let's look at the blocks and see what we have. Well, once again, you'll begin by noticing that we have the same sequence of rocks that we just saw on the previous slide. So what we can see here is we have this gray layer at the bottom. We then have this rusty layer over the top. We then have this layer which has this brick pattern. And then finally, we have this brown layer. Now, the symbols which are being displayed on the gray layer here are the types of symbols we would often use for an igneous rock, a rock that's been formed through the cooling down of magma. So I would, so for argument's sake, let's just say that this is a granite. Now, what we can see on this, on the next layer is that we have pieces of the granite in this layer of rock here. And so this would suggest that the granite formed, so magma intruded the Earth's crust, it cooled down, it solidified to form a granite. The, gra the rock above the granite was then eroded away. The granite became exposed on the surface of the Earth. The granite weathered, producing bits of granite, class of granite, and these class of granite were then included in this layer of rock right here. So that would imply that this layer of rock formed on the surface of the Earth, so we were above sea level. 
Now, then the next layer of rock, this, this uh, layer of rock that has this brick-like pattern, well, we can see that this is clearly forming underwater. So this is going to be a marine sediment of some type, probably a limestone. And so what we're, say, what we're seeing is that this granite formed in the Earth's crust, then erosion took place, so we were above sea level, that formed this red layer here. Then the sea level went up, so the land became covered by the sea again. Then we have the deposition of this limestone in the marine environment. And then later on, we've clearly dropped, moved back above sea level, and over the top of the limestone, we then have the deposition of a sandstone. So that could be deposited in a beach environment, maybe, or in a desert environment. And so you can see we're putting together a series of events. And then obviously what we can see is over time we have then had the river valley eroding down through our sequence of rocks and eventually it will reach the point of the diagram which we saw in the previous slide where the erosion has taken the river valley all the way down into the granite which is the lowest layer of rock in our stratigraphic sequence. So as I was saying, so we can see that the grey layer has been deposited in a shallow sea. We can then see that we have the sandstone deposited over the top. And we can then see that erosion has essentially sculpted the surface, producing this valley. And so these are some of the things that geologists are going to be looking for. So we're constantly thinking about what's happening on the surface of the Earth. Why is it happening? Why is it happening? And then when we get to an outcrop and we make measurements and take that data, we can then use that to predict what's happening in the subsurface. OK, thank you for watching this, guys, and have a good day.